So we're moving on again to more discussion about uh, how we get the secondary fertilizer uh, products to market and get them uh, taken up uh, in the food system more effectively. And so we're going to hear from Amir Fashovi from Green Technologies. And there's a brochure from their company on your table there. And then after that, we'll hear from Noel, Noel Lyons from McGill Compost. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I apologize for uh, <coughs> actually having to leave uh, this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm Amir Varshovi, pr president and founder of Green Technologies. Back in, uh, I guess, my previous life, I used to be at the University of Florida uh, in soil and water science department, uh, working with industry. My previous uh, actually experience was in soil and water science department with primarily soil and water chemistry. And then uh, after 12 years or so, I, was, uh, ha I had an opportunity to uh, work uh, with the industry. And uh, I went to the fertilizer and chemical industry uh, in R&D position. And after a few years, as you, some of you know that uh, a lot of changes, mergers, and acquisition happens in the chemical industry. So uh, then I had an opportunity to uh, go back to uh, Gainesville and start thinking about what's the next phase of my life as far as the, uh, <coughs> my profession. So I started the Green Technologies. Green Technologies is basically a company that we looked at how do we use, utilize uh, renewable sources such as biosolids and make uh, basically products in an effort to re uh, recycle nutrients. So that's how we, you know, uh, with this concept of uh, recycling nutrients, and we choose biosolid because obviously we had some experience using this type of material as a component of a fertilizer. And uh, so that is how green technologies uh, came about. And back in, uh, actually, 1999 took us a few years to figure out exactly what we need to do uh, to make the products and then obviously uh, the commercialization which is uh, go some of the examples that we went through and the lessons that we learned uh, we have focused on using bar solid as a component as i said and and then i explained the differences in in, in the bar solid that actually net uh, you know also uh, presented back in 2014 obviously we had an opportunity to be recognized and that helped us uh, tremendously as far as the commercialization and additional markets development so how do we go from bar solids and uh, basically to Green Edge. Green Edge is a brand name that we developed for our products. Uh, we emphasize on developing a brand recognition because not only from the standpoint of especially competition in the, in the market, there's many, many fertilizers available to, for the consumers, for the farmers and so on. Uh, <coughs> and we thought, you know, the, one of the things that we have to uh, emphasize is developing a name. For, for the for the product, so we uh, choose Greenwich as a uh, product uh, brand name. Again, we only uh, actually utilize bar solid class A EQ for the pr for our products. Now, if we don't have that material, we actually put it through a process of heat drying to produce it. We have. <coughs> developed uh, a partnership with the utilities that they have the, the dryer. And we also you know, uh, utilize class B cake, what we refer to, uh, to basically produce our own class A and incorporate additional nutrients and dif produce different formulations. So that is what typically uh, class, uh, uh, class B cake look like for, for some of you that you haven't uh, obviously seen whether it, they, they go for land primarily for land application and, and as Ned indicated there is significant uh, I guess uh, pressure on utilities to b upgrade the treatment to treat uh, the class A uh, for, for concerns about pathogens and so on 
And that is a picture of one of our actually bags that is in retail market. Uh, before we go through the process of some of the examples, obviously we looked at some you know, uh, mar market trends or t uh, environmental trends. And as you know, there's a tremendous interest in, in uh, either water quality or, or uh, you know, as far as the uh, preference of public. So we, we, when we looked at this and how much actually uh, is interest in, in the public for uh, recycling, whether recycling nutrients or protecting waterways, we thought, uh, slow release uh, type of fertilizer that also is a renewable source of nutrients would, would be a good uh, you know, uh, start from, for a stand, from the standpoint of commercialization and, and uh, marketing uh, our products. On the other side as well, uh, the, the size of the market and how much actually folks in, in US actually use fertilizers for lawn and garden activities, there's a tremendous opportunity there for, you know, especially uh, uh, small companies like us to tap into that market, which is actually much more accessible when it comes to utilizing this product from, you know, professional lawn, lawn care and, and, and lawn management supply, uh, basically companies. So, and you can see $40 billion that is spent in, in, the, you know, uh, in the US in this uh, market by the consumers. It's a, you know, a very attractive, although very difficult to get into the, uh, the consumer market. I'll give you examples of it. But uh, from the standpoint of how much activities of you know, uh, consumers in the, in the uh, London market, as well as uh, the, the, uh, the economic aspects of it. So we, we developed this process that is primarily uh, we're looking at how do we uh, impact the chemistry and then also biological you know, activity as we put these green edge products into the uh, you know, uh, soil. And one of, one of the uh, you know, focus was how do we increase nutrients when it's needed, nutrient value, and how do we dilute, for example, the phosphorus? that is in, bal in, in imbalance. And again, Ned mentioned this. So we focused on incorporating nitrogen, the compatible nitrogen that actually helps with the release of, of, of all nutrients, as well as lo looking at additional potassium because uh, biocide does not have potassium <laughs> in, in, in the, uh, uh, there's no potassium in the biosolids. So we produce these green edge products. We also have a USDA certified bio-based uh, uh, you know, uh, certification. This is primarily USDA certified is how much organic carbon in, in the product. And th that's uh, the one, one of the uh, uh, you know, primary criteria. As far as the, we also looked at how do we make the nutrients release more efficient? As you all know, from the standpoint of organic matter, for, for microorganism to break it down, that there is this nitrogen, car carbon nitrogen ratio that we could actually you know, uh, work with to make it quicker release or slow release as far as the carbon is higher, it's slower, slower release of, of the nutrients. So we focused on that and processed this uh, patented you know, uh, uh, process. In addition to that, it would help that some of the nitrogen actually releases by just irrigation or rain co uh, in contrast with the uh, typically uh, organic based material that does not release quickly. So portion of it we actually in induce release just by moisture. Now these are the examples, and, and we, we have focused to produce uh, basically homogeneous you know, uh, products. Although biocide, pelletized biocide is used also in, in physical blend through uh, uh, fertilizer blenders. But we, we are focusing on how do we make the finished product homogeneous. 
adding, as I mentioned, adding uh, potassium, adding, you know, uh, also uh, additional nitrogen. These, uh, some of these you could see that all the way to 12, we can produce 12%, which is significant. And in some biosolids, we pretty much, uh, we could bring the phosphorus to below, below half a percent. So, and also we produce different particle size because we would like to have a diverse market. Uh, for example, golf courses, you know, we, we are a Florida company and uh, we have about still 1,200 golf courses in the state, majority of them in, in, in Central and South. So, and that was a market uh, 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 obviously for us to evaluate and enter. It's uh, uh, in addition to the lawn, which is uh, you know significant you know market as well throughout the, uh, the U.S. as far as 23 million acres of home lawn, that is significant. So we we had significant need for getting actually products move every day. Production of biosolids is not based on actually the end user demand. In other words, biosolid produced every day. If we are in, in the uh, biosolid processing, so we, we get these materials every day. We have to process it. We have to make the final product and final product has to go somewhere. The difference between what we do from the standpoint of manufacturing and commercialization of these products versus, let's say, a traditional chemical industry, in this case, fertilizer. When basically there is no season or the market is, you know, uh, not, uh, you know, uh, good from economically, we cease production. We reduce capacity until we basically, uh, in, in favorable, you know, uh, uh, I guess, market, we increase uh, ca capacity and produce more and so the reason I put these trucks uh, we, we initially obviously didn't have these capabilities ourselves we still use third party but we realized that if we are in, in a biosolid processing we are got to get into the trucking as well because the third party there's a lot of things that are, uh, basically is not under our control so when, I, when we, we, we never knew that we we're going to get in trucking, but it was one of those uh, necessities that we create some capabilities of, you know, of ourselves to be able to move. We, we also use a third party as well because there is a lot of volume of material has to be moved from, whether it's from the wastewater treatment plant or from our uh, plant into uh, warehouses, distributors, or you know the end 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 users being golf courses or uh, landscapers. We have learned quite a bit about this this industry. It is definitely a n not money maker of our uh, you know uh, enterprise. So we we are also from the standpoint of network of distribution uh, partners. Again. We produce these green edge products every day. How do we harmonize uh, supply and demand and distribution is by basically diversifying our market. Not only uh, different markets in the region, but also different markets nationally as well as internationally. So we make products that we could actually ship long, you know, a long ways. When there is a growing season in the North America, there is not growing season maybe in, in, in some part of the world, but there, there is a growing season down in South Central America and so on. So the products got to move somewhere every day. And now one of the interesting things happened early on in our uh, actually the history of, this, uh, of commercialization was uh, we had a company interested that they had a parent company in China. So believe it or not, early on we shipped some green edge product all the way to China. So, and it seemed like 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, until the, 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 I guess, parent company, Chinese co uh, company, uh, realize that there is a much, you know, more uh, interested market as far as real estate that they had. So they changed all those, you know, uh, greenhouses that they built into towers and they made a lot of money. So that was <laughs> the end of that joint venture. Uh, recently, we have been, you know, uh, able to actually utilize e-commerce. And for any of you guys that would like to know where you get, get buy or purchase Green Edge, go to homedepot.com and, you know, Green Edge will show up at the, your doorstep. Our, we also have ag we develop agricultural market. I think one of the you know uh, areas of uh, when we produce actually even more, we we, t we could tap into the special uh, I guess uh, specialty agricultural market Th that especially from the standpoint of early on growing growing the uh, you know uh, the crops that uh, need organic matter any type of soil, whether sandy soil or clay that needs, can benefit from organic matter. So we could basically utilize this product, which is a fertilizer, as well as soil conditioner and soil amendment. From the standpoint of, we do quite a bit of uh, public outreach and, and developing partnership, uh, whether at the co uh, community level or cities and, and, and states. Uh, we do Earth Days, we produce uh, you know, a lot of the small bags that we give away to, to uh, folks that they come through these Earth Day activities. We have developed uh, information exchange to uh, environmental organizations such as Sierra Club and, and, uh, and River Keepers. And these are the, some of the pictures of, of Earth Day activities. The, one of the activities is teaching kids how to grow, basically plant uh, flowers and, and those. So, and every year about uh, maybe a, a thousand bags of greenage. Folks that they have got used to it come and make sure that they get their annual bag of greenage, uh, you know, before they leave the event. So these are the things that I think it's critical for, uh, I guess, uh, our, uh, whether being a small company, or, but primarily because of the nature of, the, of, the, of our industry. We are not in a, never in a defensive mode, but we're, we're very much, you know, uh, I think proactive. And I think that is one of the things that we always talk to our uh, utility partners, that we, we need to basically exchange information that is necessary for the people take, uh, you know, uh, actually interest in using these recyclable nutrients. Another thing that we do, we, we very much get our customers, uh, you know, uh, involved. If we have a, a new product, we pro uh, in uh, addition of university research and, and uh, efficacy data that we produ uh, produce, we also give uh, products to our customers that they are interested to test it themselves. Regardless of the university data, they like to do it and, and see it for themselves. So that's how we get folks, and this is one of the golf courses, uh, actually a five golf course that, uh, you know, uh, used Green Edge significantly. Trade shows, obviously, these are all p part of our, I guess, commercialization, marketing, and advertising. Uh, in, we we uh, provide information and participate in uh, three different industries, uh, water and uh, wastewater utility. Uh, we are a member of WEF. And we also member of fertilizer industry, as well as uh, you know golf course, you know superintendent association of America, and uh, chemical American Chemical Society. So we try to basically be as many places as we can, <laughs> get the word out, and at the state and and, and federal level we uh, participate in uh, any activities that we get invited to or we invite ourselves. And uh, looking at donating products for research and demonstration projects. Uh, and also uh, public acceptance is one of the critical part of our you know, activities. And this is a, we have been 
awarded uh, a biosolid award for public acceptance in the Florida Water Resource Conference, which is, a, is a, again, a state uh, trade organization. And recently, uh, we have uh, awarded the second phase SBIR for actually developing a media for removing phosphorus. So th that is, uh, you know, in the hopefully in two, three years, we have, you know, more information that we could provide to this group. Uh, but this is primarily focused on low phosphorus removal. We're looking at one ppm and lower. And uh, I think from that, my presentation is, uh, you know, uh, done. I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please uh, ask. And thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Amir. Any questions from the audience about Amir's uh, technology or strategy or his approach? Uh, just quickly, how many white waste water treatment plants does it allow you? No. Just was asking, how many wastewater treatment plants do you view as supplying the material? Or they supply to us. Raw, raw product to right. you? Right. Well, actually, we, we have, uh, over the years, we have had different, you know, we work with contract, basically, based on contract. So uh, we've had uh, probably about five or six different, you know, utilities. Some of them, they're still, you know, continued with us. And, and we just, uh, I'd be glad to um, you know, actually invite you to our facility that is a completely private facility that we are building, should be in operation mid-year in North Florida, that we actually bring, bring the cake for processing. And this is the first of about three that we plan to build in, in Florida. And uh, so about our uh, basically partners uh, in, in biosolids, providing biosolids is uh, right now in Florida, but our products goes nationally as well. Yes. Okay. Actually, you may have answered my question. I was curious, with a base in Florida, just how, how much of the country uh, your product actually reaches? Well, we have actually through Home Depot, and we want to thank Home Depot for actually taking up Greenage. Uh, so the product goes to the Washington State, New York, a anywhere, uh, because if they go to a website, homedepot.com, and Greenage, they purchase Greenage. It shows up on the doorstep. So, so you can get it in Hawaii. The not Hawaii. Not Hawaii. <laughs> According to uh, Home Depot. Oh, how about Alaska? No. no. no continental. 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 That's right. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, I guess you're taking biosolids from, from treatment plants. Right. right. You establish contracts with them. But I also heard you say that when demand slows down, you slow production. It seems like to me those two things don't sync very well. The, the guys are still producing the biosolids, and if you can't take it, then what? Well, we, we are contractually, we take it. Yeah. yeah. We we'll take it, and we ship it some, after processing, it's gonna go somewhere. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the, yeah, that's the a, that's a challenge that we get better and better at it every day. Yeah. So, yeah, the production doesn't stop. Someone gets left holding the bag. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, one more question and then we'll uh, move on to our next uh, speaker. Okay, could you uh, characterize uh, the kinds of wastewater plants that provide uh, just kind of size uh, and, and are they uh, dominant residential the wastewater? The bigger, the better. Larger wastewater, so but they have more industrial contribution than with potential for problems there. Well, w one of the things that I probably uh, that may maybe mentioned, uh, th there is uh, a group in each uh, w w wastewater treatment uh, utilities called a pre uh, pre treatment uh, group that issues a permit to a industry that can tap into the wastewater treatment, you know, uh, or sewage system. So, and that was actually as a result of uh, Water uh, you know, Quality Act back in the, you know, Nixon's administration. So, the, that issue is being taken care of prior for the, for the industries that they need to be regulated before they even can tap in. So, but again, 
in, in Florida, you know, uh, obviously, uh, and many, many uh, metropolitan, th there's a significant, you know, uh, groups that they monitor that. But at the same, the reason I say the larger the better is basically uh, we can, you know, let's say five truckloads of class, uh, you know, big, uh, you know, 80% uh, 80, 80 moisture would turn into one. So there is a significant moisture is removed. So concentrated nutrients in, in a, you know, 95% solids. So a small, a smaller, obviously, utilities, they don't even have, for example, this, the cake. They haul liquids, and we're not in that business. OK, we're going to move on to our next speaker. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Amir. Thank Big you. hand for Amir. Oh, hold on, you got the microphone. Oh, you know what? Don't let him go to the airport. I can't leave it, That would be bad. All right, so uh, in keeping with the theme about the innovations that are going on to uh, begin to produce these recycling flows in the food system, we're going to hear from Noel Lyons from McGill uh, Composting. McGill Environmental Systems, I'm sorry. So take it over, Noel. And this is um, left, right. Magic button. All right. Okay. Okay, I'm going to talk a little about composting, talk about McGill, and talk about how we contribute, both we McGill and we the composting industry, contribute to, to the recycling of phosphorus. And very briefly as an intro, I want to talk about kind of composting as, or modern composting as an industry. It is, you know, composting is, is, is known as really a, a process and the use of compost, uh, I guess, as something that gives a, a, a very, very wide variety of benefits which sometimes can be uh, 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 confusing, quite frankly. And if I go back very brief, you think of composting in the 80s, it was probably first and foremost uh, an alternative for um, ocean dumping of sewage sludge. In the 90s, the hot subject was diverting yard waste away from landfills. And more and more recently, I think the whole focus has turned on the product manufacturing and the use of that product. And I was, I was hoping that Sally would be here because I was dying to say, I think she gave the right answer when she said the issue of the future is soil health. Those of us in the composting industry are absolutely believe that the future is in this area is about soil health. So a little about uh, McGill. We were founded about 26 years ago um, by uh, two people, but really it was uh, the guy who deserved the credit for founding. It was uh, one who, he passed away about three years ago. His name was Jim McGill. He uh, was an environmental science graduate from Rutgers University in New Jersey. And while they are actually, he was a grad student um, under a Dr. Mel Finstein, who is the individual pretty much credited with developing what became known as the Rutgers process or the Rutgers strategy. So, uh, and Jim got a, had the opportunity of being in the front lines when that was happening. Um, I was very much the junior partner in the, in the founding of the company. Uh, today we employ about 100, um, we've got about 100 employees. And last year we passed uh, the number of re having composted five million tons. Okay, uh, so how we describe our business, we build own and operate composting facilities first and foremost. Secondly, we market and sell the compost products that we make at those facilities. And finally, we do some design and management for others. Okay. Uh, where we located heavily in the United States, even though the company was founded by two Irish guys, we actually uh, started the business in the Black River watershed area of uh, North Carolina. Uh, thanks actually to some encouragement from the uh, North Carolina Department of Agriculture, who, uh, who obviously saw the problem with phosphorus and nitrogen and that. Um, we, uh, the facility in Florida is actually a partnership with the uh, Seminole Tribe of Florida. Yeah. We also have a couple of facilities in Ireland down in the southwest, one in County Cork and uh, one in County uh, uh, Waterford. Okay, so our vision, uh, contribute to more sustainable life on earth and provide most effective solution for depleted soils. How we like to describe the business and the opportunities in composting really is as follows. The one thing that all organic waste has in common is it all came from the soil. Composting is a very, very good way. All that soil organic that absolutely needs to go back into the soil. Composting is a very, very good way of fixing that organic waste so that it can be put back into the soil. And then of, of the, to, to achieve that is to best use our composting technology to inform the widest range of biodegradable waste to premium compost products. I'll talk about the, 
variety of ways in a moment. Okay. So, what we compost? We compost a very wide variety of things. Uh, wastewater residuals, a subset of that is what we would term today a biosolids. Uh, we also had a lot of wastewater residuals from various industrial activities. A uh, big, big portion of that is, um, comes from agribusiness. Um, companies like Tyson Foods, ADM, Cargill, Smithfield Foods, uh, uh, they're all customers of ours. Uh, vegetative waste primarily, uh, yard waste as we call it in the US, green waste as we call it in Ireland. Um, other mix up, there's a very, um, uh, other day's subject probably or another day's presentation on the other. It's the widest variety of, of things you can imagine. A uh, couple of both we have. Number one, we are the largest ginkgo leaf composter in the world. Um, uh, we believe we are one of the largest, if not the largest, US currency composters in the world. Um, and some other pieces of useless information. Uh, okay. Um, our products, we sell a product uh, very much similar to the gentleman before me, to a very wide variety of, of markets. I could sum it up in this is that we are after problem soils, or maybe more specifically where uh, pro problem soils and the need for a high end result come together. Whether that high end result is a farmer wants to improve his or her crop, or a landscaper or a homeowner wants a better looking lawn, or a golf course wants a better looking fairway. It's the worst, the poorer soils give us a chance to shine. And to that effect, a marketing line of ours in the, in the golf course industry is when we meet a skeptical superintendent is, you know, show us your worst fairway and let's see how we do. And usually compost products do much better in that kind of environment. Okay, um, a little bit about the McGill technology. As I said, it's a, it's an evolution of uh, what was known as the Rector's process, and quite honestly, virtually all modern indoor composting is to some degree um, derived from what was known as the Rector's strategy. Um, some big things that have happened over the years is we've been able to cut the composting time from four and a half months when we started to consistently under 30 days today. Uh, we've achieved that through a couple of things, uh, probably a number of things, but the two important ones are uh, today all the facilities are weather independent and this, this wonderful thing called continuous temperature feedback. Uh, in early or outdoor windrow composting, which some of you may or may not be familiar with, it's customary to monitor your temperature once per day. You may not necessarily do anything about that temperature. In our, our environment, we're collecting temperature data once a minute and that temperature data is being fed back to a computer system that's adjusting aeration. So in essence, the uh, microbes are telling us what the optimum environment for them, and we try and create that optimum environment 24-7. Yeah. Um, compost markets, it's really all across, all, all across the board today. It's probably landscaping, um, sports turf, and environmental markets. Um, and I'll get to a little more about that, in, about phosphorus and that in a moment. Environmental markets are bigger and bigger and a big part about the future, we think. Okay. And then I just did some math and we talk P205 phosphate all the time, so I didn't convert. Um, okay, the slide is a little off there. Um, but we just did some math. What we did, these are our 2017 figures uh, from our four US facilities. Oh yeah, they're way out of shape. Uh, what we did was we do a monthly analysis, so the 2.2, the, uh, 1.7, etc. There's the that's the 12 results for the year average. So it's a pretty accurate figure for the amount of PO205 we recycled. And I think the figure was like 3,100 and something tons in the year 2017. And then we did an estimate of, and the way we did the estimate, we took the same year figures per plant per year by the number of years each plant has been in existence at full capacity. So we, we recycled in the year 2017, our, sorry, our life today, approximately 37,450 tons of P205, which I guess is what, 50, around 15,000 tons of uh, P or something like that. Okay. Then just a quick note for the composting industry. You know, the, the US composting industry is maybe the industry everywhere is made up of a lot of very, very small businesses. So there isn't a, there isn't a lot of very good information on exactly what they're composting and uh, both in terms of quantities and the quality of that. Um, the US Composting Council estimates, the, estimates these two figures. Um, 
So as an industry, even if a lot of these compost materials are probably significantly lower in P than we're processing, uh, they're still making a fairly sizable contribution to P recycling, I think, in the country. Okay, so we talk about how, I guess, how we're involved in the whole issue of phosphorus recycling, and I'm going to touch on three points on that. Um, the first one is what we call the issue of uh, rural to urban. Yeah, and I guess a lot of organic waste, obviously, in their raw state, um, they're, for one, for one of a number of reasons, they're not very suitable for urban use. They're objectionable from an odor point of view. Uh, they may be, uh, in, you know, the waste materials are very liquid, so they're, uh, transporting them is, is, is not that difficult, or there may be some agronomic issue about them. So what we do in composting is we can convert those agricultural waste to a form that they're very suitable in the urban market. And obviously in urban markets where there is going to be a deficiency, a deficiency of phosphorus. The uh, second one is stormwater and erosion control, which is a part of the environmental market I mentioned earlier. This is a very big market for us today, and when we think of stormwater, there are two aspects to it. There's what we call stormwater prevention and stormwater treatment. And in stormwater prevention, what we're doing is, or our customers are doing is, they are adding compost to the soil and therefore adding lots of organic matter. In return, the soil is holding on to a lot, lot more water. So there is less water, stormwater to run off and there with it, less pollutants to, go to, to leave the soil. Uh, a generally accepted figure today is that a 1% increase in organic matter increases the water holding capacity per acre foot of about uh, 20, over 20,000 gallons. EPA published it at 27,000 gallons. NRCS published it, I think, at about 21,000 gallons. Uh, and then the uh, third one would be a pollu uh, pollutant removal. There's been a lot of great research done on this and regulatory agencies that deal with stormwater in um, most states today, I believe, accept what are called uh, compost-based ba products, compost blankets and compost filter socks as an acceptable means of treating stormwater. And pretty much across the board, these products will far, far outperform things like silt fencing and those type of things. And this is the one, this is uh, Dr. Uh, Britt Fossett, who's very, very well known in the industry for uh, research in this field. Uh, this is his, or his uh, work. Okay. So finally, just a very quick look at the future. Um, I think in, co in composting, I think uh, more and more uh, people in the world are talking about the, uh, you know, getting away from a linear economy to a circular economy. And it's hard to imagine uh, activity or an industry that fits that better than composting. You know, it's often referred to as nature's recycling. Where we see the future is very much in the more refined use of our products, and obviously phosphorus and phosphorus management is going to be, is going to be a, a big part of that. Probably the leading one is actually the use of compost um, in disease su suppression and um, refining and making specialty compost. Like we're, we're doing a lot of work in Florida at the moment where we're working with a company that's adding an inoculant to our compost. And that product now has been used very, very widespread. We're now into year three of using it commercially in the citrus industry. To, uh, to address the issue of citrus greening. So there's going to be there's more and more of that. So that's where we see the future. So the more the compost market grows, by default, we will recycle more phosphorus. And it's not that I think any composter is ever going to build a composting facility just with the expressed uh, idea of recycling phosphorus. We will by inevitably, I think, recycle, continue to recycle a lot of phosphorus. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot for that. We have time for questions uh, about the McGill uh, story. Anyone have anything they'd like to talk about? Are you using any cow manure? Um, not today, no. Some, pol some poultry. Uh, no thanks. Uh, no thanks. Yeah. Uh, Do we use any cow manure in our in our products? Yeah. Sorry. With the growth in um, municipal composting, I, I'm sort of wondering to what extent you're looking at that market, and then also to what extent you might be looking at a business line that is 
coaching or providing the, the intellectual services to those who want to do it themselves. Because you know, a lot of times municipalities don't like to, they want to own that process. And so just. Yeah, to the, to the first part of your question, uh, I may be for, we sort of see ourselves you know, in a way as part of municipal composting. Uh, you know, with, with food waste and green waste, we're working very, very closely. Over 60% um, plus of our customers are municipalities on the waste side of the house, and maybe 20% of our customers on the compost sale and use side of the house are probably municipal customers. Overall, there's a movement away from the public sector uh, doing the composting and, and, and more towards privatizing. Um, on the Consulting side, we get, in, we get inquiries about that on and off, and uh, I think it's the thing I want to do when I retire, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was curious on your uh, comment about disease suppression, and recently there was a study in the Amish that showed those that live closer to the farm, actually it was better for human health in terms of uh, the immune system and disease suppression in humans. So have you considered, considered that as a market potentially bringing, through composting, bringing a little bit of the, the yeah. farm to the yeah. urban, urban Actually, life? Um, um, no, but that's a fascinating, that's a fascinating idea. Um, I, actually, as somebody, as somebody who grew up on a small dairy farm, I, I'm familiar with that principle, if I may call it, um, and I happen to, be, I happen to, be, to believe in it. Um, no, but no, we have not, yeah. yeah. But the, the whole area of basically you improve soil health, the plants are more resistant, and there's a lot of, there are a lot, there are a lot of uh, very well understood uh, mechanisms, mechanisms by which this actually works. Yeah. Thank you. It looks like an impressive amount of phosphorus recycled uh, that you gave yeah. for 37,000 tons figure. Have you looked at the, the mass balance of nitrogen? Are you able to recover a significant fraction of the nitrogen in the original materials as well? Um, we, 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 Track actually that the exercise I did here for phosphorus could be one I could easily do for nitrogen. Uh, I would say that um, because we're indoor, f an indoor facility, all our facilities are primarily indoor. I there's zero loss of phosphorus through the process. I would expect that there is some loss of nitrogen, but I would expect that we collect um, uh, the vast majority of it. But actually, that's an exercise that we could do pretty easily. It would be an interesting exercise. Yeah. yeah. To what extent are you doing or looking at methane capture as well? Well, I guess in, in composting done properly, we're focused on the prevention of the, the production of methane. Yeah. Yeah. And if we do our job very, very well and that continuous process control should actually inhibit the production of methane at all. Yeah. Good presentation, thanks. And um, have you run up against any state or federal regulatory issues regarding either the composting process, facility siting, or uh, sales and use of the material? Um, the, the, for the most part, regulators are our friends. Now, where, where it gets a little, more, a little gray is, in siting is always a challenge. And it's rarely the regulators, it's rarely the rules. It's a subjective aspect. On the compost distribution, you know, there are areas, we're in multiple states, so there are some, Maryland is complicated. Um, it would be nice if we could get regulatory approval uh, or Department of Agriculture certification, whatever it uh, applies, that, that, if, that mattered in all, was uniform in all states. You know, like in North Carolina, we basically have the choice in North Carolina whether we want to be a fertilizer or a soil amendment. And uh, we chose to be, we figured the, for economic reasons, we chose to be a soil amendment. Being called a fertilizer would have some value in the agricultural community, but we don't think we'd offset the taxes that we would have to pay on the material. Yeah. So I had a question on the, on, again, a regulatory question. You talked about the inoculant and the su suppression of, of citrus greening. Yes. It, again, are you running into regulatory issues with that as well, just because that's a, you know, there's going to be big money to be had there, and there's going to be big companies that want to get into that market. Uh, yes, we, um, I think as the gentleman from um, Mexico talked about earlier, and it, with his with, uh, phosphite, you, 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 he's, I think, not, not calling it a fungicide. We are not, we can't go out and say that we, you know, that we have a pesticide. 
Uh, what we can say is, and the, we work with a great company down there who have actually developed the inoculants called Live Foils, and they are at the front face of that. But in essence, what we have to talk about, the way we have to deal with it today is we have to talk about the, what you might call, the generic benefits of soil health. I'm uh, sorry, of compost and how it contributes to soil health. And what has happened in, uh, I guess, uh, the way I like to describe it to others in, how, uh, others, uh, uh, in the industry is, we weren't good in Florida, we got lucky. And what I mean by that is we built a composting facility in the right place, and farmers were in a, in a terrible situation with, with citrus, in a catastrophic situation. So they were very receptive to trying anything. And the results from the compost use were phenomenal. So and that's really how it evolved. So, uh, yeah, but there have been a couple of people have patented individual, individual uh, I guess, microbes or um, genetically modified microbes for some diseases, but nobody has really commercialized that in any large way yet. Yeah. Great. Thank you so Thanks. much, Noel. Appreciate that. Give me a big hand. Thanks.